He had fought from Fargo, North Dakota, where nobody appreciated his humor. Uh, really crappy town. But he said, you know, Gene, sometimes he runs this like it's a 250 watt daytimer. Mm. He said, I've had a broken turntable for the last week. He, he said, it's not fixed or replaced. He said, Chuck, some things never change from that 250 water you worked at where, you know, you were paid in free records. Welcome back to the Talking Archive. I'm Josh Jacobs. Check us out on Instagram at joshdj57. That's joshdj57. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel and get frequent updates about when we have new podcasts, which is usually once or twice a week. And our conversation continues now with Chuck McKibben, and we teased you about a legendary DJ. I'll tell you the one about a real radio guy, of course, one of the ultimate radio guys, and that's uh, Casey. Yeah, in fact, he was first known as Casey of the Mike when he was at KEWB Channel 91 in San Francisco. The uh, survey said he struck out at baseball, but he hits home runs every night with your favorite music. And then when he came to Carolay in Los Angeles, that's when he finally went by his real name, Casey Kasem. Uh, he'd been hired sight unseen by Dairy Queen to do 40 radio and TV tracks for the entire coming year of uh must have been um, 74, because this was 73 when it happened. And uh, the people from the ad agency and the big shots from Dairy Queen are sitting behind me in the control room and making everybody very nervous, because, of course, how are we spending our money here today? We've got 42 voices to record, 42 tracks, on, on quarter-inch tape running at 15 inches per second on Ampex 350 tape recorders. That's how it was done. Ampex tape, Ampex 456 tape for nerds out there who care about that sort of thing. And we were going to rock and roll early in the morning, 9 a.m. And Casey has not tried out for this. He's the voice of young America. He's the voice that kids listen to. So why would you give him an audition? After all, it's soft ice cream we're selling, mm -hmm. right? Except they invented a new word that year, scrumptilicious. Now, if you remember, Casey didn't think much of his own voice, or if you've ever read, read anything where he talked about it. He said, my voice, and I'm using his words. This is mm -hmm. not an insult. He said, my voice is garbage, but it's unique. You can identify it. Uh, but he knew he was not one of these great booming voiced announcers like Bill Baldwin. Mm -hmm. So um, he had the scratchy, you know, the, the uh, Southern California sound which is odd since he wasn't really from there. But anyway, he's, he's um, not an experienced voiceover artist. Let me put it as graciously as I can. He's a celebrity. Mm -hmm. He's a radio host reading scripts, but they don't have words like scrumptilicious in them. He couldn't say it. So he's reading cold. Okay, let's roll tape. And he goes, Dairy Queen is not just great. It's scrumptilicious. <laughs> <laughs> it's scrumptious. It's scrumptedilly. What is this word? Uh, it's a combination of scrumptious and delicious. It's scrumptilicious and dilly in the middle. Mm -hmm. Scrump. I ended up by the end of the day recording him in a full 14 inch reel of tape going scrump, dilly, icious, every way we could think of. <laughs> the phonemes, those are phonemes, pieces of words. And I spent two weeks piecing them together into the blank spaces that he left every time we came to scrump Billy Ishes. But that wasn't the only problem. He had kind of a soft R, kind of an Elmer Fudd R. How ironic is that, <laughs> that he's in no blank studio? But it's Dewey Queen? That's what they kind of heard, Dewey oh, Queen. Oh, man. And, okay, I heard the whispering behind me. We, we've, we've resolved we're not going to say scrump Billy Ishes. That's fine, but he's still got to say Dairy Queen with a hard R. <laughs> Noel says to these guys, listen, gentlemen, we're, we're putting a lot of pressure on Casey. You know, he's got all of you staring at him. Listen, gentlemen, go downstairs, have some breakfast on us. I'll pay the bill. Uh, you're our guest. Uh, come back in 45 minutes or an hour, and we'll have a lot of stuff in the can to play for you. With that, and I'm so honored that I can say this truthfully, because nobody was there to witness it, but I'm, I'm telling you the truth. Noel says to me, go talk to Casey and work out this problem. 
I said, I can't talk to this guy. He's a superstar. He said, yeah, but you're a former disc jockey just months ago. And he's a disc jockey. Mm. You're, you're on his team. And I'm not. I'm Mel's son. I don't do voice. You know, I don't want to do voice. So uh, I said, okay. Uh, uh, okay. So I go in and I play advocate. I say, you know, these jerks, these suits, they don't know what they're talking about. They think you're saying Dewey Queen. Is that stupid or what? Just to humor them, Casey, I admire you. You're, you're a superstar already. You're buying office buildings in Los Angeles, you know. Uh, but just humor them. Just exaggerate like Tony the Tiger. It's great, you know. Jerry Queen, just stretch those R's out, <laughs> and uh, we should have no more problems, okay? And if, if you do it really good a couple of times, I can just, I can paste those in later. I'll copy them and paste them in. So that's how we got through the day. Wow. He was so nervous. Now, here's a man who was on top of the world, and he was making a fortune by then already. This is 1972, 73. Must have been 73, yeah. And he is literally buying office buildings as investments mm. with cash deposits. So you'd think he'd be very calm. I mean, he's doing Scooby-Doo and all that. But you know what? He was on that phone when we had hardwired phones and nobody carried around a cell phone. He would ask to use the phone every time we stopped for a break, every time. And he'd call his manager or agent and say, what's up tomorrow? What's up tomorrow? You're making half a million dollars today. <laughs> But it shows you the nervousness of anybody working in Hollywood. They mm. want to know they will be working today. And they have something lined up tomorrow. Mm. It's, I think, on every actor's mind. They're never at ease completely that they've got it made. Never. I found that out. Yeah. Everybody there was picking up some extra coin doing a commercial because right now they're not making a movie. And I was told by another guy, Harry O'Connor, that who had a similar studio on at hollywood and vine he said you want to meet the stars go to unemployment they've just finished nine months of filming now they're going to collect unemployment because they're qualified for it and they're going to take it mm. wow yeah. true i said you know you could stab me with a knife and twist it and not cause me more pain than to hear that he said well if truth hurts then it hurts but uh i have a whole harry o'connor story about how he ripped me off by offering me $100 more a week, which was a lot of money then, to uh, go over and work for him at Hollywood and Vine, where I could walk to work. But the first day I started there, and he had a similar facility, uh, he said, now here's what it's going to be. I'm going to pay you under the table, and uh, you know I'm going to pay you the difference, uh, but uh, you're going to collect unemployment. And that's how he happened to tell me that story. Mm. So thank you very much. Uh, Harry O'Connor is long gone. Good riddance. You know, he, he made everybody happy by leaving the room. Yeah. Uh, uh, Harry was a cheat. He was, and he wanted me to cheat. And I said, Harry, I'm not going to do that. You know, you can go to prison for that kind of act, for, for calling yourself unemployed. He said, anyway, I left Mel to come work for you because you offered $100 more. And that's a lot of money these days. You know, and uh, now you're not going to make good on that. Well, I'll make up the difference. <sighs> this doesn't work for me at all. This doesn't work. And so I quit him after just giving him one week of my service and collecting what he had promised me for the week. Unfortunately, my timing was hideous because the oil embargo, the Arab oil embargo hit that week, and every audio engineer in Hollywood was out of work. Because if you can't get oil, you can't make vinyl records. And if you can't make the records, why record them on tape? which is also made with oil. Oh. So ba basically, everybody was let go by all the major studios if they were audio guys. And I'm talking about Western recorders where Beach Boys worked, uh, of course, Capitol Records, RCA Records. I think they went under in big part as a result of that because they had a big barn of a studio. Mm. All the big studios were hurting because they had multiple audio engineers, of course, who would work for months on a record but now why make a record if you can't sell it so i picked the worst conceivable time i met with drake chenault i thought hey they're doing you know their syndicated shows they were impressed with my background but they said we don't have any openings sorry you know and uh, if you haven't got an opening you haven't got it but i saw their studios which were not 
overwhelming in any sense. And in fact, most of Hollywood facilities were not overwhelming. They were kind of, Gary Owens said it. He, he said, Chuck, you know, I work at KMPC. I've got my own studio and all that, but I make $125,000 a year. The salesmen who sell time on my show make 250000 Wow. True statement from Gary, by the way. True, absolutely true. He was pissed at Gene, who would not let him work a five-day week. He said, I would love to have an honest-to-God weekend. But Autry says, you've got to be live, your three, four-hour show every single day, Monday through Saturday. You're too big a star to let you pre-tape it or anything. He said, I've offered him every kind of deal. At the same time, he told me, I've been offered the morning show at WOR in New York. Um, they've offered me a quarter million to replace John Gambling because his act is kind of old. He's not funny. Wow. They think they'd do better with me. But he said two things. I don't want to get up that early to do a morning show. And I don't want to live in a vertical city, his exact words, mm. where you're up and down on elevators all the time. He said, I've got a house here. I've got a wife. Uh, we have our difficulties, he said, privately. Mm -hmm. We've got our difficulties. I'm married too young, he said. Hated to hear that from him. Wow. And, you know, there, were, there was a dark side to Gary. He was afraid of being accosted by a crazy, as had happened, actually, already. There was a guy shot in the air studio of a talk show who was a little too controversial, and somebody barged in and shot him dead on the air. Well, after, after that, they heightened the security at KMPC. You had to go through several tight layers of wow. security and have an appointment. Uh, but I did every week, thanks to his syndicated show. And I found out one day when he took me for a little ride around town in his Lincoln Continental that he'd been given by Ford Motor Company as, as uh, you know, a, a trade uh, for doing some Ford commercials. Uh, what did I notice in the center console but a sawed-off shotgun? I said, Gary, uh, a shotgun? He said, you know, there's a lot of crazies in this town, and I'm not going to be the victim of one. Mm. Wow. Now, Andy, uh, Randy West, rather, Randy West knows of that. And Gary apparently, and I didn't know this until I heard Randy talk about it, uh, one day somebody took his parking spot at Goldman West, and apparently all four tires got shot out. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think Gary was a little upset. Wow. <laughs> Man, I mean, you know, he had fought from Fargo, North Dakota, where nobody appreciated his humor uh, from, you know, really crappy town. But he said, you know, Gene, sometimes he runs this like it's a 250 watt daytimer. Mm. He said, I've had a broken turntable for the last week. It's a friggin' QRK $200 turntable, right? Mm -hmm. Piece of junk, really. The Rumble Master, if you remember they were called that. And uh, he, he said, it's not replaced. It's not replaced yet. It's not fixed or replaced. He said, so I'm hobbling along on one turntable at a 50,000-watt radio station. He said, Chuck, some things never change. Never change from that 250 water you worked at where, you know, you were paid in free records. <laughs> no. Hey, we got another box. Anybody want? Uh, you know, you, you, were, you were paid in trade and so forth. But he said it never gets better. It's only a bigger transmitter in a bigger city, but it, it doesn't get better. Isn't that sad? It is. I mean, I remember uh, Gary, um, you know, um, working at Music of Your Life, and um, yes. somebody had talked to him, a, an announcer who did weekends on Music of Your Life, Dave Dino. Dave Dino said, um, even Gary still has to go to uh, voiceover auditions to make money. Yes. I thought yes. to myself, wow, Gary Owens, radio and voiceover superstar, still has to, he, he's not yes. retired or, or he can't retire comfortably, you know, just right now. He yeah. still has to yeah. work. Uh, and that was kind of a, a shocker to me. Um, I was talking also with um, uh, Skip Nars. His uh, dad is game show legend Tom Kennedy. Oh, Tom Kennedy. Yeah, uh, Jack, Jack Nars, Nars is his brother. brother yeah, uh, Skip is Jack's nephew. And um, I met uh, Jack and Tom uh, several times. And this wow. one time I met Tom's son, Skip, at the, the Game Show Congress Convention where Tom and Jack were both honored with the Bill Cullen Memorial Award, uh, Lifetime oh. Achievement Award. Oh, there and, is such uh, a thing. That's nice. Bill was it such was a... great. And it was um, the greatest. 
Yeah, he was he was great. One person I interviewed, uh, Jim Peck, said when he didn't get the job hosting Joker's Wad after Jack Berry died, it went to Bill Cullen, and uh, he said, "But if you look, if you look in the dictionary, the nice, the word nice guy in the dictionary, Bill Cullen's <laughs> name is right there in front." Yeah, um, right. So, uh, Skip Nars told me that the family had just bought a brand new home in Toluca Lake in 1969 when Tom had already been hosting You Don't Say for about six years. And then NBC suddenly canceled the show. And he said, for a while we struggled because there was no, there was no job for, for, for Tom. And what's crazy was that after the show got canceled, it got replaced, I think by, uh, uh, um, name droppers, which was hosted by Loman and Barkley, Mm -hmm. which only ran for about 13 weeks. They found out that, that last ratings book for you, you don't say the show had the highest ratings ever, oh, wow. but instead of bringing it back, they went with something else, which is kind of crazy, which shows oftentimes these network ex- executives don't, want, don't know what they're doing. Oh, the suits. They're no, they're idiots. idiots. <laughs> Even I owe, by the way, I owe them nothing and I don't rely on their good graces. So I can say that pretty safely. We are talking with voiceover talent and audio engineer, Chuck McKibben. He's also the author of the book, Mel Blank. The voice of Bugs Bunny, dot, 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 and me. Inside the studio with Hollywood's Man of a Thousand Voices. And next time, Chuck shares more wonderful stories about Mr. Blank himself.